Alice Barnes. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, for this moment in time that you've granted us by grace to be together, to fellowship, to break bread, the very bread of life, Father. It's such a privilege to be here. May we never become familiar with it, but recognize it for what it is. It's an expression of your love. Father, we're so grateful for this place of worship, for this family, for the word that washes over us. We pray for those in the congregation that can't be here this morning, that you heal them, restore them, return them to the fold, so we might fellowship with them as well. Father, we pray for those that are still lost in this world without hope, that they be humbled, repent, receive saving faith before it's too late. Father, we are most grateful and thankful for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to Make times like this morning a reality for us to enjoy. We do just ask for blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit we do pray. Amen. Part 90, the book of Hebrews. The key principle that's been woven into our messages as of late, and this is a result of studying uh, chapter 3 and 4 of the book of Hebrews, is simple. Forfeiture is final. Forfeiture is final. When something is forfeited, there's a finality to it, and that's that. We have to accept what the Bible gives us on this topic. Is it uncomfortable? Sure. Can it maybe rattle us a little bit? Absolutely. I think those are good things that happen in our souls. Paul said, examine yourselves to make sure that you're even in the faith. So it's a healthy exercise to go through. A little uncomfortable, a little unsettling, um, few checks and balances along the way, but we have to know and accept that forfeiture is final. Our more context-sensitive principle, as related to the book of Hebrews, has been that the writer introduces the motif of the impossibility of a second repentance after apostasy. So apostasy is a very severe sort of indictment on certain individuals that still physically exist, haven't died yet, but have essentially, in light of truth regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ, said no. So apostasy, by definition, implies forfeiture. Our introduction to this concept has been through, again, the tail end of Hebrews 3 into Hebrews 4. So let's go to Hebrews 3.19. Let's start there, regain our footing. Again, we are on part 90 of this series. I want to say the first half or so was just context setting, which was great. Hebrews 3.19. So we see, and again, the author was... Or the writer was referring to Psalm 95. So we see that they were, Israel, unable to enter because of unbelief. So they forfeited their deliverance. They made their choice, and God said, Okay, have it your way, but you'll never have my peace. so that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And there's a certain forfeiture 
that the writer uses to amplify the message he's sending this congregation. In other words, beware. Make sure you're not counted among the apostates who have forfeited their salvation. Next, the writer puts a sense of urgency to this reality. He does so by introducing the element of time. Look at 4 verse 1. So not only does he put this, let's call it scary, idea of forfeiture of the forgiveness of sins on the table, which is very real, he also says this, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. In other words, before it's too late. While the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. In the end, God holds everyone accountable for their actions. And there are conditions, he puts out there, regarding his blessings. Not everything is a given. Not everything's a cookie jar. I know the average person today, even the so-called Christian, wants to think of God's grace as a cookie jar, something they can just, at their own whim and forevermore, indiscriminately almost, reach into and grab at any point in time. But God does not work like that. That's not the way the Bible lays out grace. It's God's to give. And it's up to Him to decide who gets it and when. And if someone rejects Him, He says, then I will reject you. And you will not get my rest. God holds everyone accountable for their actions. Hold your thumb there. Go to Romans 14, 9. We're going to really drive this point home this morning just so you're completely convinced that God does indeed hold everyone accountable for their own actions, for their own decisions. Romans 14, 9. So we'll get back to Hebrews. But the Spirit really wanted to highlight this topic of accountability. Romans 14, 9. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. All we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Again, the point is, God holds everyone accountable. And he's not just talking about believers, but unbelievers as well. Go to Matthew 12.33. Matthew 12.33. Again, Romans 14.12 read, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Matthew 12.33. Again, a little more on this topic of accountability. It's not just for we believers, but also for unbelievers. Like he said, Romans, every knee shall bow. 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure 
brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Again, just a little deeper dive into Holy Scripture on the topic that God holds everyone accountable. Even though some seem to think that they can fool him, or maybe even hide from him. I think we get delusional for, for a while. We think that uh, maybe God's not paying attention, or maybe you know, he's so busy with everybody else that's uh, you know, doing this or that, that he's not really paying attention to me. And we can fool ourselves into that kind of delusion. And I'm just as guilty. We think because we're doing something in private, where no one, no other human being can see that somehow we're out of God's sight. But that's never true, especially for believers, because guess what? The Trinity indwells us. So whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever we say, whatever we put into our bodies, whatever we take out of our bodies, all of it is in the presence of God because He indwells us. Go to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12, again, the point the Spirit's making here, out of the gate, is accountability, that God holds everyone accountable. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of of the heart. And then look at verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. You know, when we read the Word of God, that's just His way of showing us that there's none of us are hidden from His sight. That the Word cuts to the chase, doesn't it? That it doesn't, quote, let us off the hook. It reminds us that we can never hide from Him. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now that's our starting point. That, to me, in my soul, relates directly to the fear of God. And the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of what? Wisdom. So if you want to get anywhere in the spiritual life, you've got to start with the fear of the Lord. And you have to accept the fact that He's with you every step of the way, and He holds you accountable for everything. Good, bad, or ugly. All of it. In a more permanent sense, as it relates to salvation proper, go to Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9, verse 27. So again, it's not just for we believers. We believers can learn. We can have that word of His cut to the chase. But this accountability is for all creatures. Hebrews 9.27, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes what? Judgment. So, in terms of, say, unbelievers, those that have rejected the gospel, uh, those who have disobeyed the gospel command to believe, when they die, after that comes judgment. They will be held accountable for that decision. All right, back to where we are observing this sense of urgency. All of that just gives that, what, that sense of urgency or that that warning about apostasy. It gives it a sense of urgency. It gives it sort of uh, more substance when you realize and you're reminded of the simple fact that God holds everyone accountable. So we have this sense of urgency the writer of Hebrews was apparently beginning to impress upon his audience regarding salvation or the flip side apostasy. Hebrews 4.1, 
Therefore, while, again, there's the introduction of a time element, which imposes a sense of urgency. So not only is this really scary, but there's a sense of urgency to it as well. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Last time we went a little further into our passage, so let's do that, verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest. And he has said, As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest. Last Sunday, we read Psalm 95 as a refresher uh, regarding the source of the writer's Old Testament quotes here. And my recommendation is going back there every so often to keep your mind tuned to the context of Hebrews. I can't do that. I only have you for an hour on a Sunday, right? And Scott does a review on Thursday nights. That leaves a lot of extra hours for you to lean into this stuff to go back, to do your own homework, to do your own due diligence on this stuff. You know, put in the reps. Did you guys know I write blogs? <laughs> Here's a couple of excerpts from this week's blog, which was titled, Putting in the Reps. I use a bodybuilding analogy, a running analogy, any kind of athletic endeavor requires repetition. You got to put in the reps to get any better at it. To make any progress whatsoever, you have to put in the reps. The analogy is learning the Bible, then, is a daily activity. Like athletic training, we must maintain proper form as well while exercising our minds. What I meant there was you can't just show up and go like this, I <sighs> haven't had my coffee yet, but I'm just going to go. Okay, that's done. Let me go get my coffee. That's like doing terrible reps in the gym, right? It's like saying, I'm going to do some curls, and you just kind of like do this, right? What do you gain? Nothing. Probably some sore joints. You have to put in the reps, and proper form matters. So when you show up to read your Bible, you have to be in what? Proper form. The right frame of mind. You have to have a, a quiet space. You can't do it while you're vacuuming. You know, I hear people, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to keep, you know, flooding yourself and keeping your mind off of other things, that's great. Doesn't mean you do it in the car in traffic. That might be better than to listen to 94HJY. Not that I ever have, because I'm way too pure for rock music. Nothing wrong with that. But you need to have proper form at some point in your day where you're just reading your Bible and you're completely engaged, concentrated. It matters. So like athletic training, we must maintain proper form while exercising our minds. It's not just quantity, but quality that results in progress. One more part of this blog, quote, to stand up a proper defense. Remember, we're all called to give a proper defense for the hope that is in us. To stand up a proper defense, we must know both our own truth and the truth of our opposition. To heed Christ's words, we must train hard. We must learn from the Bible what it means to defend our faith against those hell-bent on trampling it. This is why I recommend going back to Psalm 95 on your own every so often to read what the writer of Hebrews was referencing. Repetition is an imperative 
to learning. That was the point of the blog. You have to keep reading your Bibles. And you have to do it with proper form. I mean, you're better off, let's face it, reading one chapter with proper form than five like this. You're better off focusing on one chapter and deeply meditating on it than reading a whole book haphazard or distracted. That's the point. You've got to put in the reps, but you also have to put in the reps with proper form. So repetition is an imperative to learning. That's why lazy people make very little progress, whether it's physical or mental training. Reading your Bible must be a daily activity, and it must be done with proper form. One last excerpt from this week's blog to help drive this home. Quote, Have you ever met someone who used to put in the reps with their Bible but has since gotten lazy? What did you notice about their spiritual strength? Were they a person of conviction, or had they become complacent, weak, and possibly even errant in their thinking? Had they become syncretic, blending worldly religious thinking with biblical truth? Were they incapable of doing as the Apostle Peter firmly suggested? And in the blog I referenced 1 Peter 3.15, but I want to read the passage for greater context and meaning this morning. So go to 1 Peter 3.8. 1 Peter 3.8. Remember, Peter's the one who said, you need to be ready to give a defense for that hope that is in you. But how do you do that if you haven't done the reps? Think about that. How can you possibly defend against the opposition if you don't show up for practice if you're on an athletic team and you don't show up for practice, you only show up for the games. What happens when you're on defense? You're not going to defend the goal line very well. 1 Peter 3.8, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Now, I want to take pause there. Have unity of mind. Sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Okay. In other words, those are the ties that bind us together. If you think about this family, this morning, this group of individuals that God has brought together in this church, what are the things that tie us together? This isn't an exhaustive list, but it's certainly an indicative list. Sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Isn't that... Aren't those the ties that bind us together? Isn't that what sort of pulls the shoestring regarding unity? Aren't those all things that pull us all together in the name of Christ? You bet. And so this is what Peter's saying. He's saying, finally, all of you have unity of mind. In other words, march to the beat of the same drum. When you're playing as a team on the field, act as a team, function as a team, practice as a team. Even outside of practice, when you're at the gym all alone and you've got to put in that final rep so you can push off that offensive guard, so you can defend your goal line, that's you being part of that team. That's you defending preparing to defend. That's all part of this, quote, game that we're playing. And we're all individual members of it. And then when we come together, when it matters most, we have to have that sense of unity. And that's why I like the analogy to family. And that's why I always start off praying for this family every Sunday because this is what makes us a family that we have unity of mind that we're all putting in the reps 
I granted some of us are, you know, like can't even spell G-Y-M. But guess what? Before you go judging anyone, tomorrow it's going to be you. Just saying. Again, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. I was thinking about this. Uh, I'm dating myself, but whatever. You're all pretty old, too. (laughs) Have you ever seen the Boston Celtics play when Larry Bird was in his prime? Oh, it was crazy. Bunch of The outstanding feature was that they played as a team. Now, granted, Bird was a freak of nature on the court. But if you asked him, he'd say they won championships because they played as a team. He was also a phenomenal passer. Not just a ridiculous shooter, but a phenomenal playmaker, a passer. And he, according to his teammates, worked harder than anybody else. People would go there and look for him. They say, "I heard legend, you know, legend. What do they call him? Larry Legend. All he did was just shoot all day before he was the first one there, the last one to leave." And I read this story recently about how uh, people heard about that. Some of the, you know, the new guys in the team heard about Larry Legend. And they're like, they went to the gym early, like really early before practice one day, and they're like, "He's not even here." And then he looked up in the rafters, and he's running up and down the stairs. Right? At 60 years old, when he was a coach, he ran a 520 mile. Still getting it done. Right? They possessed unity at game time because of all the practice they put in. And likewise, this is what the Apostle Peter was getting at. In 1 Peter 3.8, for starters, finally all of you have unity of mind. That doesn't just happen. The only way we can have unity of mind is if you go home and read your Bibles. And then when you come here, we understand each other. We get each other. We have a certain flow. We have a certain teamsmanship, gamesmanship, a certain collective direction. We have a unity. In other words, Peter was saying, function as a team out there. But this doesn't happen unless every individual member of a team puts in the work. Again, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. And here we have the point from the blog, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And the point the Spirit's making here, and he was making it in the blog, is that if you put in the reps, you'll be able to put up a good defense. 
One last question before we get back to our primary passage. How, pray tell, do you maintain a good conscience as a member of God's team, playing out your own part if you skip practice all the time? How do you maintain a good conscience if you skip practice all the time? The truth is, and I see this all the time, that when a person has gotten lazy and hasn't put in the reps, they become disoriented. They become disoriented. They become like ships without a rudder on the open sea, like Paul wrote. Go to Ephesians 4.11. Ephesians 4.11. If you haven't put in the reps, you become weakened. And you're susceptible to the ebbs and flows of this world. This world doesn't sleep. The kingdom of darkness never rests. You need rest, but it doesn't rest. Ephesians 4.11 and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, become like a unified team. In this sense, loosely speaking, I'm the coach. I'm doing my very best to coach you to shepherd you, to guide you, to push you, to irritate you, to make sure you're not settled in your complacency, in your laziness. That's part of my job, is to poke and prod you, which is why on any given Sunday, half of you can't stand me. <laughs> I don't know why Scott's laughing so loud. That might mean something. <laughs> Scott's like, yeah! Stand him. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not here to be loved. You need to respect the office. You don't have to like me very much. You need to respect the office, though, and appreciate what God does for you by grace. That this church is open faithfully for you to poke and prod and train and push, teach, preach, encourage, exhort. All that good stuff. To make you better members of the team. And that's what Paul was saying. He's like, we're in this together. Paul wasn't puffy or arrogant. Right? He also wrote Romans 7. He said, ah, listen, I'm at the end of my run here, and I still don't do the things I want to do. Right? I'm doing things I don't want to do. I still don't have it nailed. But one thing I do, I press on for the upward call of Christ. Right? And that's what he wanted. As a coach himself, that's what he wanted for his team. Right? He said, imitate my faith. I'm not perfect, but let's do this together. Let's put a mark on this world. Let's push back against the kingdom of darkness as a team. Let's put in the reps together until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, let's keep going in verse 13, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. A person who doesn't put in the reps is like what Paul described in Ephesians 4, tossed to and fro. And how well are you going to rest? Let's take this a little bit back to Hebrews now. They shall not enter my rest. How well are you going to rest if you're like children tossed to and fro. <clears throat> Paul described the very opposite of peace. 
So back to where the writer of Hebrews alludes to the same idea. Go to Hebrews 4, 5. Hebrews 4, 5. This idea of unrest, of lack of peace. And again, in this passage, he said, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 4, 5. They shall not enter my rest. In other words, without obedience, a.k.a. putting in the reps, a person will never experience transcendent peace. And just for clarity's sake, I insert the word transcendent very purposely. It's not just to make it sound better. There's a reason why I use that word transcendent quite purposely. Because as the old adage says, God may choose to calm the person, not the storm. Didn't Jesus himself exhibit what transcendental peace looks like? Go to Matthew 8.23. Matthew 8.23. No one was more obedient than Christ. And look what he was able to do in the midst of a storm. Matthew 8, 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. He was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord. We are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? And I was thinking about that as I was just reading this. He said, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? What does Romans 10, 17 tell us? I'm just thinking about this now. Right? It says, faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of Christ. Putting in the reps. It's the word that saves. It's the word that delivers. But if you never read it, if you never meditate on it, so on and so forth, what does that say about your faith if faith comes from that very activity? And then what happens in a practical sense when the storm hits and you haven't been putting in the reps? You're not asleep in the bow. You're like Paul said, you're tossed to and fro on the waves. Completely different experiences. Someone's got peace and rest. Someone's hair is falling out. Guess I had a lot of stress in my life, huh? Right? One's doing really well, one's a catastrophe. All because of what? They haven't been putting in the reps. Again, sometimes God calms the storm, sometimes he calms the person. Go back to Hebrews 4 5. Hebrews 4 5. This is all coming to a crescendo here. Let's pull this together. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. The they in view was Israel, and they were disobedient. Right? God made promises. He had conditions on those promises. He said, you have to do what I say. You have to go where I say to go. And they said, nope. And then what did he say? Then you don't get my rest. So the principle we've been carrying for a few weeks now is godly rest implies godly grace. If you refuse his grace, you forfeit your peace. You forfeit that rest. You have to accept what he gives you in the manner in which he gives it to you. And if he says, listen, put in the reps. I'm not going to do everything. That's not grace. People have this weird perverted version of grace in contemporary Christianity. That's not actually biblical grace. 
They think they can just sit in their armchair and just put their cookie in the jar and Jesus himself is going to come strolling around with one of those little dessert trays, right? And there's a cookie jar in there and he's going to come up to you while you're sitting in your armchair watching the football game and say, oh, 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 I'm not close enough. Let me get really close to your arm. You go, let me have some of that grace. And you do absolutely nothing. You've got no investment, no reps. You're all atrophied. You look like a, 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 a doughboy, right? you got nothing going on. That's not grace. You play a part in this. And if you want to hang out in the recliner, then you forfeit your peace. Oh, it may be comfortable for a moment, but you will forfeit your peace. And you will not be at rest, even though you look like you're resting. Godly rest implies God's grace, of course. But if you refuse His grace, you forfeit your peace. That's what we've been pulling from Hebrews 4. This holds true most profoundly for unbelievers who never rest, who ultimately end up in the lake of fire where there's torment, gnashing of teeth even. But this also holds true for believers experientially. I was having a good conversation, I think it was on Friday, with a member of this congregation about this very topic. And it was making me giggle because as they were describing their current lack of peace, they were essentially describing the guts of this week's blog, putting in the reps. And the blog had already been written. So this was like a little secret between God and I, because I had written the blog. It wasn't posted yet, but I was having this conversation. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is kind of neat because this person needs to hear this blog, needs to read this blog, and I can see it. They hadn't read it yet. So it was encouraging for me because it goes to show that whatever the Spirit has me write, it's perfectly timed for you all in this congregation. For example, there's a bazillion other topics I could write about, but he chooses those you all need to hear. Very encouraging when that plays out like that. This person was describing their loss of peace and that God revealed to them the reason was because they had been going their own way for a while. That they had kind of departed from the practice field, from putting in the reps, from showing up. And even though maybe they come to church, maybe they're sitting right there, or maybe they're not. That was a joke. There's nobody there. Nick, laugh! Come on, man! Throw me a rope. Maybe they're here, but they're not here. Do you follow? They're physically present, but they're not, they're still not putting in the reps. I think about my, uh, this is a complete digression, so just bear with me, but it always makes me laugh. My brother, when he was young, he went on steroids for a little while. And he had a friend that went on steroids with him. But he didn't work out. <laughs> Wait a minute, what? So he just grew man boobs. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on, man? I'm sorry, moobs. Right? It's like, what are you doing? Definitely not worthy of the medallion, Scott. That's an inside joke. When Scott was young, he had a medallion of a bodybuilder because he said he was all jacked up when he was young. Cheryl, is this true? Was he all jacked up? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> uh, ouch. Anyways, this person was describing their loss of peace and that God revealed to them the reason was because they had been going their own way for a while. And it happens to the best of us. This person also shared that all this talk of apostasy gave them hard pause. And it, it even frightened them a little. And I told them the simple fact that since they're repentant and suffering in this moment, even having that conversation, that God is disciplining them. And that 
they're responding to the convicting ministry of His Spirit. And that's really good. That's really good news. You can fail, but if He doesn't let you go, if He's in there going, hey, I'm still here. I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. I see where you're going. I see the decisions you're making. You know where you're going, don't you? And you're like, yeah. Well, let's get back to it, shall we? That doesn't happen for unbelievers. God doesn't do that for unbelievers. Hence, rest assured, and I'm not God, but it sounds like this person is one of his children to me. Hebrews 12.8 says that if God doesn't discipline you, you may consider yourself an illegitimate child and not a son. Because God disciplines those he loves, as any good father does. So that's very reassuring. I want to go to that passage quickly. Go to Hebrews 12.5. Hebrews 12, verse 5. So it's good to be shaken up. That's how the Spirit gets our attention, doesn't he? It's good to be shaken up. But know the truth. Have confidence in your salvation. If you're a child of God and you're being convicted, that's a good sign. Right? If he's working on your good conscience, that's a good sign. <laughs> Hebrews 12.5 And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Here's the thing. If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. It means you're an unbeliever. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seems best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Love that. The peaceful fruit. You want peace? There you go. The peaceful fruit of of righteousness. God is doing you a favor when he disciplines you because he's getting you back to that place of righteousness in the sphere of righteousness so that you can have peace. That's the opposite of not entering his rest. Does that make sense? In context? God's doing you a favor when he disciplines you because he's trying to take you back to a place of righteousness so that you too may have peaceful fruit. To those who have been trained by it, therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Do the reps. Put in the reps. Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak, and your weak knees. How are you going to strengthen your weak knees if you don't do squats? If you don't put in the reps in the gym? And make straight paths for your feet. In other words, have good form so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. You know, one of the best exercises, if you have arthritis, one of the best things you can possibly do for arthritis is exercise, is strengthen your joints. Just a side note, no extra charge. <laughs> Verse 14, strive for what? Peace with everyone. If we're all on the same team, let's pull it together. You pull it together by doing the reps. Coming together like this, with the unity of the mind, the unity of the faith. Didn't we just read that earlier? See how it all ties together? Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one 
people see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. All I can think about is that picture of the person in the lounge chair. Typically, they're the ones spouting off the mouth, root of bitterness, causing factions in the body and all this kind of stuff. Why? Because they're miserable. They're not good members of the team. They've been lazy. They've been complacent. And so they spread that kind of gangrenous, cancerous type awfulness. Many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral, unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Mm. So that was the conversation I was having with this person who was struggling and dealing with a little fear with the mention of apostasy. If your conscience is crushing you and the Holy Spirit has been pressing into you, then you are a child of God. That's what the Bible tells us. If that's you, it just means you're out of sorts. It just means God's doing you that favor to bring you back to righteousness, which, for most of us, implies and requires discipline. And I've taught this many times in the past. God's hand, when's the last time you saw God's big hand come down and slap up anybody upside the temple? It doesn't happen. How does he discipline you then? Your conscience. If you're a believer, that's that's the first order of business. Now, if you ignore your conscience for long enough, certain things might happen in your life. Maybe you do get sick physically. We know that's a biblical principle as well. Maybe the conscience isn't good enough. Maybe you get sick physically. Maybe you keep on ignoring all of that, and he says, I'm done with you, I'm taking you home. We call that the sin unto death. You see the sort of gradations of discipline. And he does it all to bring you back to righteousness for his glory. Not, you didn't bring glory to him if he had to take you out of this world as a child. That's like a failure. When that happens, what the line in the sand is, I don't know. I'm not God. I'm trying to encourage you this day. If your conscience is crushing you and the Holy Spirit has been pressing into you, then you are a child of God. That's really good news. You're like, but it feels bad. Yeah, for a time. Discipline is tough, but it yields the, the, the fruit of righteousness, right? the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Such conviction means that he's trying to draw you back to himself, to the sphere of God, to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I think I got those in the right order. But if you're savvy, you know what that is. That's Galatians 5, 22 and 23, right? That's all he's trying to get you to. Why? Because he loves you. That's, a love, that's what a loving father does. While you're spitting and moaning and groaning and grumbling and accusing and yada, 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 the good father says, it's okay. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you enough to look past your ridiculousness in this moment. You're moaning and you're groaning and you're spitting and you're blah, 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 blah. Your crossed arms and the whatever's going on. I love you that much. I want you to have the fruit of my spirit. I want you to enter my rest. Because I love you. And then he sends folks like myself to teach messages to convict your conscience. All grace. It's what he does for his kids. All by grace. Do you think you deserve that? Do you, let me ask you a question right now, because everybody's guilty of what I've been teaching here, myself included. We all wander, we all... Do you really think that you're worthy of that? Do you think you deserve this kind of love? Honestly. Is that a, is that a fair question to ask? Do you think somehow you're worthy of this kind of love and attention? And discipline? 
Do I have to say, do I have to answer that for you? You have to, you must surrender in humility for any of this to happen. You want to enter his rest? You have to surrender. You have to say, uh, I get it, Lord. You just love me enough to stay on me. You love me enough to haunt my conscience. You love me enough to give me the word that the Spirit can use to convict me. You love me enough to raise up a guy like this bonehead to remind me on a Sunday morning of what the truth of the matter is. That's how much you love me. You think you deserve that? What did you do in the past week that makes you think you deserve this kind of grace? Seriously. Oh, well, I walked an old lady across the street. Ain't you special? And you let everybody know about it, didn't you? I always get a kick out of that. Oh, did you know that this superstar person, they give, they give quietly to the poor? Then why do I know about it? You follow I'm getting it? Everybody's got their own little PR section, don't they? Ourselves included. Don't we? No? How do we magically let everybody know all the good stuff we do? Seriously. Unless you opened your mouth. Unless you're trying to prove something to the world that you're a special guy. You're a special gal. Maybe somehow in that sort of, you know, convincing sort of PR pitch, you think that's why you deserve this kind of a message. That's why you deserve this kind of love from God. That's just you being ridiculous. You will never deserve this kind of grace. Never. You just got to surrender to it. Just surrender already. Some of you just need to go like this. I've been holding on, white-knuckling the world for so long. I got one hand on God and I got another hand on the world. And I'm like, just, and you think you're like Samson, right? I'm pull it in. And all you need to go is like this. Just let go. Yeah. And you don't deserve that, by the way. But anyways, the principle is godly rest implies godly grace. If you refuse his grace, you forfeit your peace. All right, let's go back to our primary passage. One more read to pull it all together. We have communion service this morning as well. Hebrews 4, 6. Let's go there. Let's try to pull this all together. I've given you a lot, I know. And I know I didn't do a perfect job teaching it, but I trust that you're going to go home and meditate on this, right? Right? Thank you. Give me some hope, will you? Yeesh. Hebrews 4, 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's literally what I just told you. Surrender. Think about what I just said to you. You don't deserve any of this. He's given you grace. Don't harden your hearts. This is your moment. Right? So surrender. Just let go. There's nothing you're holding on to that's worth even close. Remember the parable of the guy that finds the pearl in the field? What does he do? He goes and sells everything for the pearl. This is your pearl. The truth. Surrender to it. Sell everything. Let go. Nothing even compares. Verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then... There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. 
For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive. There's always that notion of a wrestling match, which means you're involved in this thing. It's not easy. It was never meant to be easy. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Letting go can be hard. That's the wrestling match. You're like, but I really kind of still like that life that I'm living. I still don't want to let it go. There's still a part of me that doesn't want to let it go. That's the striving. It's a wrestling match. It's real. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Again, one last reading of this principle, godly rest implies godly grace. If you refuse his grace, you forfeit your peace. From last week's messages, we have the practical principle. The urgency of obedience is a function of the severity of punishment that disobedience carries with it. So there's a sense of urgency here. In other words, the Spirit saying to you, let go, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, because you got some business to do here and there, right now. Let go now. Surrender now. Choose obedience now. Obedience to God's salvific plan is a very real sense of urgency to it. Obviously, we're pulling principles out of this as believers, but the writer was really fearful of apostasy all different levels of obedience to God's will. Remember, God wills that all are saved. You understand? So to disobey the gospel, there's a sense of urgency to it. To see the gospel for what it is and then say, no thank you, I'll take my own righteousness. I'm not even sure if God exists. Yeah, Jesus sounded like a swell guy. I've heard about him. I've heard the gospel, but I'm not having it. That's really scary. Because God may just say, have it your way. You can live out the rest of your life, like Romans 1, part 2, if you want to call it that, from 18 to 32. You can live your life out, but I'm handing you over at this point. And that's about as good as it's going to get for you. I don't like to even think about that. And I don't want anybody getting any closer to that line. And that's that sense of urgency. And that's what the writer was saying. I don't want any of you to get any closer to that line. And I definitely don't want you to cross over. But since I don't know how close you are to that line, I'm not God. I'm just going to put a sense of urgency into you right now. Just stop in your tracks and turn around. Stay away from that line. Because once you cross it, you've forfeited forgiveness of sins. You've forfeited it. We've got a lot to think about. This is a pretty heavy message this morning. A lot of moving parts. And again, I'll just reiterate in closing before we take communion service. Don't assume the only time to think about these things is while you're here. That's a habit that I think a lot of people are guilty of. It's great that you're here. It's wonderful that God, by grace, gave you this message. But this cannot be it, folks. This can't be it. Surrendering the way that the Spirit said surrender this morning is not fulfilled by just showing up today. Let these messages marinate in your soul. Meditate on them. Examine yourselves. Surrender. Amen?
All right, let's get ready for communion service. I won't say much here, but let's just take this moment truly to celebrate the one who made it possible for us to be children of God, to have the privilege of understanding and loving God, and then be disciplined by Him to His glory. He's the one who made it all possible. Let's remember Him. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me remembrance of the person of Jesus let's eat the bread in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup in remembrance of his work. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Thank you for this family. Thank you for giving us the ability to bring glory to you in time. Father, we don't, we don't deserve any of this. It's incredible. It's stupendous that you've chosen us vessels of mercy to bring glory to you. We're humbled. We're overwhelmed. We're grateful. Father, we just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families even, and your will be done out to a world that needs the truth so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.